Welcome to the second part of creating an environment with reality for Poser. In the previous video, we created the basic scene. This is the scene that we had at the end of the video. And uh, in this scene, we have the basic uh, buildings, the water plane, the sea bottom, and we configured the IBL to create an environment around our scene to basically have a sky and the right illumination. So in this video, we're gonna concentrate on the materials. So to show you that, I'm gonna load the scene that I used for the final render, which is this. Poser is still loading the scene. Here we are. So this is almost identical to what we saw before. I have a few plants. Again, these are from Lisa's Botanical at uh, hivewire3d.com and I added this bed. We're not going to look at how I position this. This is just standard poser uh, workflow. But let's switch to reality and see how the materials are configured. So let's open the villa and in here I'm going to click on the edited header to group all the materials by their edited flag and I click again to have them in the right order. So here we have all the materials that I changed before. So let's start with these guys here. The first thing we need to do generally when we look at a scene is to identify those materials that can be changed easily, that can be identified easily by the type because in reality in Lux we have types for the materials. In Poser we don't have types. Every material is of the same type. In reality generally you start with the glossy. This is what is the used for default. And in this case we have aluminum, black metal and chrome. I mean these are obviously names for materials of type metal and we change the type. But you change the type by simply highlighting a material, right clicking on it, and then selecting one of the types. So in this case, I change them to metal. You can do it you know, three at a time by selecting them all together and then right click and select to metal. That will change them to the new type without needing to do it one by one. So in this case, we have aluminum, it says aluminum, so we can use the aluminum preset. You see that there is a texture color that is coming through the conversion of the poser material. We're not going to use this because this is the color that was used to try to simulate aluminum. It will never get any close to the real deal. So we have the preset for aluminum, we select it, and I set the horizontal and vertical polish that are synchronized at 8000. I'm just trying to get quite a bit of shine out of this material. The black metal is converted to metal as well. In, in this case, we did use the color configured from Poser because I don't quite know what black metal is. It's probably some sort of, of anodized prop that is in the, in the scene. So. I'm just using this color and again a preset and again a polish value at 8000. Chrome is uh, particular because Chrome is basically mirror finish. So the polish value is much, much higher. Now, all these other materials have been changed to adjust the bump map make it a little stronger or to lower the, the shine. They were a little too shiny at the beginning. And these are not really important. What is important is to look at the roof exterior. Now, if we look at the image render here, you can see that these tiles have actually a real surface. Now, if we switch to the promo, 
that was used for this scene. Now you see that basically the, the, the tiles, the shingles, are completely flat. Now I didn't quite like that because it doesn't look real. And uh, I really wanted to have some real detail here. So how do we do that? That is done, again, through our friend, the displacement map. Now, um, the original model doesn't have a displacement map, but I'll, I'll let you know a little secret here. It's not really a secret. Displacement maps and bump maps are basically the same thing. So you can use a bump map in the displacement map channel. Now, it's not that simple though, and let me show you why. If we look at the scene using wireframe, we can see the detail of the rooftop. So let me actually switch to this view. And we can see how the rooftop is made out of these large squares. Again, large squares don't displace easily. And we have to devise a strategy that will allow us to displace this surface with the right amount of detail and at the same time without overloading our system. I'm going to just erase this scene and create a new one in which I just add my simple plane. Let's move this away. Okay, so here we have the simple plane. Okay, I'm going to just angle it a little bit and adjust my lighting so that the mesh light is more directly positioned. Okay. So let's take a look about this plane. If I switch again to the wireframe mode, you'll see that this is a single plane. So I cannot quite displace it, can I? Well, let's try a couple of steps first. So I'll go to reality. And I'm going to click on the simple plane and start configuring this to be the same material that we saw with the rooftop. So I want to obtain this kind of effect. So first of all, we want to assign the right texture to the diffuse channel. So we want to paint those shingles. And that is easy. We click on the diffuse texture. In here, let me just resize the window a bit. This texture is of type color, doesn't work for us. We want an image map. So I'll change it to image map. And then I'll load a new file for this image. So select a new file and I'll navigate where the texture is, which is inside my poser content, in the environment, runtime, textures, second world, tropical villa Bora Bora. And here we have the roofing texture. Okay, so I'll select this. Now it's loaded. The material has changed immediately. So what we want to do is to make a couple of adjustments. First of all, this is a little too shiny, so I'll lower the glossiness level, but also the specular color is too bright. It's reflecting too much light. So I'll lower this a little bit. And that works. Now let's do a quick test to see how this renders. And here it is. And um, as expected, this is rather flat. Well, I don't want flat. This is not convincing. This is not realistic. I want to have these tiles, these shingles, be appearing three-dimensional. OK, so let's close Lux Render. And we go to 
the modifiers tab where I want to enter a displacement map. Now, as we look at this channel here, there is no displacement, there is no texture. See, this says none, it means that this slot here is empty, there is no texture. So, I click on this wheel and select from the new menu, image map, because I want to create a displacement based on a map that I already have. This model comes with its own bump map. And we just said that bump maps and displacement maps are the same thing. Well, since I already have the map, I want to use it. And I just create an image map texture. In here, I click on select a new file, navigate in the same directory where we found the roofing diffuse map. And here I have the roofing B for bump map image. And this is exactly what we need. Now you see that it's a grayscale image. That is exactly what bump maps and displacement maps use. With this kind of image, and when it's used in the displacement channel, the black becomes negative displacement, which means anything that is dark or is black will be pushed down. And anything that is white will be pushed up. And everything that is gray in between will be interpolated, will be basically moved in a direction that is proportional between that lowest point and the highest point. So this is exactly what we want. We select it. Now it is here. And then we try to do a render. And this is the point where I usually get an email or a message in the forum where somebody says, your stupid program doesn't work because it doesn't displace. I use the displacement map. Look, it's still flat. Now, the program works, just that the configuration is not correct. Um, but yes, it's not displacing anything. Remember what we said before, with a solid polygon, the only thing that you can move are basically just the corners. There is nothing in there, there's no level of detail that allows me to move anything in this solid plane. So I cannot, just because I want to, I cannot displace this. Uh, but this is not the end of the story. So let's go here. And you know, I'm gonna just increase these values tenfold. So really bump up the the displacement and try again so let's go and see if anything happens at that point and this is the proof you see that this is curved now it's still one piece but it's curved and this is proving just what i said you can change the corners but nothing else moves here actually it's not really true because with a displacement map, reality automatically applies one level of subdivision. What is that? Subdivision means that we are dividing this square by splitting each side, this side and this side. And in fact, you can see that there is basically a bend here. Now, with one level of subdivision, since we are separating, we are splitting each side, this way and this way, we are creating four squares. So we have one square here, one square here, one square here, and one square here. But this is not enough detail. This is not even close to uh, being sufficient. But we can see that there is, in fact, some displacement happening. So what do we do? Well, we can continue dividing. Now, if I do an, a second level of subdivision, we'll keep splitting. So our four squares will become 16. Every level of displacement quadruples the amount of polygons we had before. So let's close this. And let's bring these guys back to the original value. Okay, so I can go two levels, three levels. Let's try 
seven levels. Now, that is a lot of subdivision, but let's try it. Here we go. Now, this starts looking really promising. See? This is actually showing some detail. Not quite as much, but it's getting there. So let's go one level more. And before we do that, I'm going to just get some information from Lux Render because I want to check what's happening. Now, normally when we launch Lux Render, the log detail level is only set to show warnings, and that's okay. But in this case, I want to have detailed information. So I'm going to select this option here. And then I go back to the materials and increase one more level. Remember that every time we increase one level, we quadruple the number of polygons we had previously. I have eight levels of subdivision. We are getting into some serious territory. And I'll show you exactly what's happening. So let's render this frame. And I can immediately see that this is already shaping up as a very detailed material. We can even see that there is a little bit of lift here. Well, it's not quite as pronounced here. Now, this is very, very, very nice. Could be better, but it's already very nice. Now, if we click on the log, tab here, we can see a couple of interesting things. Here it is. Shape simple plane. That's the plane we used. Uh, adding eight levels, that is what we selected, of loop subdivision, whatever that is, to two triangles. Hold on. I have a one square. Why we're talking about two triangles? The reason is very simple. Reality triangulates everything in your geometry when it exports to Lux. It doesn't do anything to your original model. But when it exports to Lux, every square is divided into triangles. So basically, if you draw a diagonal here, you end up with one triangle here and one triangle here. So this square is now internally two triangles. And the reason is the net result is much nicer. It's better to triangulate. So, this is our object that is now two triangles. So now Lux will apply eight levels of subdivision to two triangles, ending up with 131,072 triangles. How did it get to that point? Well, simple. We have two triangles. Every level of subdivision is quadrupling the amount of polygons available before. So two times four gives us two triangles subdivided one time, two times, three times, four times, five times, sorry. six times, seven times, and eight times. 131,072. We verify this number. Now that's a huge amount of polygons for one single little square. Let's take another look at this. If we look at the memory price that we are paying. I'm using the activity monitor in macOS. Uh, this is similar to using the task manager in Windows. Uh, in Windows, you would do it with a control alt del And the memory footprint of Lux is basically 300 megabytes for rendering one little square. Now, sure, it looks gorgeous, 
but 300 megabytes, it's a pretty hefty price to pay. And that is why you need to be very, very careful with subdivision. So you might ask, what is the, the solution that we can have? We cannot use this. This is just too, too big. And it is. But there is a solution. There is a, an alternative. Let me explain you what the alternative is. Let's close this. So remember 300 megabytes of memory footprint? Now, if we go back to reality and select here the subdivision, do you see this checkbox, Use Micro Facets? That is our savior. There are two types of subdivision in Lux Render. One is called loop subdivision, that is what we just used. It basically splits every polygon across the sides, and that quadruples the geometry. Then there is the micro facets subdivision, which is a way of dividing the geometry that works in a completely different algorithm. It's much more memory conservative, and it can create incredible detail. Now, the numbers that we're going to use in this case are way different than what you would use normally with loop subdivision. A loop subdivision rarely goes beyond this level, and this is very, very high. Very often, you have two or three levels of subdivision with loop subdivision. With micro facets, because it's using a completely different approach, we are going to increase this to 200. And now we render, and you'll see the difference. Let's wait a second more. Now here we have already a lot of detail, but we can see even more. See these little ring wrinkles on the wood? This is bringing really the detail of each single tile up. Look at the little lip here, we see the little edge. This is fantastic detail. This is really, you know, if our scene is uh, framed really wide, but if we were coming closer to the, to the building, we would see really a lot of detail. This is fantastic, a fantastic effect. This is very, very detailed. Now, let's take a look at the memory footprint. 124, 25 megabytes, 125 megabytes. This is less than half of what we had before. So the final result is more detailed and less memory intensive than what we had before. And I know that you might think, let's use micro facet subdivision all the time. Well, micro facets work well for inanimate objects like this, because they are always rendered flat. So each single f little facet, these are very, very small, but if you were going to get really close, you would see that they're actually completely flat. So they will look faceted. But because the level of detail is so high, it works. Now, with a human figure, it would not work very well. So it is perfectly good for buildings, walls, uh, rooftops in this case, but not for smooth objects. In this case, it's perfect. So let's go back to our scene and load. Don't save. Okay. So here we are back to our scene, and let's take a look at the material for the roof exterior again. The bump map here is configured straight from the material from Poser, and we don't ch change this at all. This is the displacement map that I added, and it is configured pretty much as we saw in the other example. The negative and positive have been increased a little bit, but 
that is just because of the distance. You know, we are working on a wide angle shot with the subject being very, very distant. So this is basically what we configure in the example with a plane. The other materials are really not that important. We can take a look at the water plane, which is important. Now, if we look at the tint, starting from the first parameter, the tint, it seems almost like white, but let me show you exactly what kind of color this is. I can go to the HSB sliders, which means the hue, saturations, and brightness sliders. It's basically, this is an alternative way of defining a color instead of using RGB. The net result is exactly the same. But with the saturation slider, I can show you really that this color, it was around this when I first selected. And then I lowered the, bright, the saturation to 1%. And the reason is that when we look at this scene, the depth of the water is such that it will, just a little bit of color will make it really, really dark, really saturated. So we just need to drop a little bit of color, it's just a droplet of color, and then the depth of this volume will do the rest. So this is really kind of a nice blue, but desaturated, as much as possible because of the depth of our body of water. Of course, with a, with a smaller body of water, like, I don't know, a swimming pool or a ball of some liquid, you would not need to go so low. The other parameters are the ripple amount has been bumped up quite a bit to 1.5. The ripple type is I just selected the classic two just to try something. The clarity at depth is being set to 0 0.05. So these are just the changes in the main materials and some of the challenges that you might encounter when setting an environment. I hope that this overview has been useful for you. And uh, if you have more questions, as usual, you can post them at our forums. The address of the forums is listed in the notes for this video, and you'll find it also in your reality user's guide. My name is Paolo Ciccone. I want to thank Hivewire 3D for providing the models in this video. Take a look at their catalog. They have a great selection of products, both for Poser and as Studio. Thank you for your attention. See you next time.